it's Nurse Baker. Morning, everybody. So good to see all of you here. Glad you're joining us uh, today. Glad you're joining us as well online. There, good to see you guys as also now or later. And uh, want to jump into the the message right away this morning. I have some important things I think for us to talk about. So I'm the father, if you didn't know, of four daughters. Uh, they're all out on their own now, uh, which means I'm old officially. Uh, but when they were much younger, when they were preschool age, early elementary, all of that kind of stuff, and we were going to go anywhere, I always would try to make it a big deal, mostly self-serving to motivate them to, you know, get their hind end together, get their shoes on and all that kind of stuff. But like, right, we're going to Walmart. Hey, we're going to Walmart. And then, you know, let's get shoes on. And whatever, we're going to the store. Hey, we're going to the store. Whatever it was, I'd, I'd be excited about it. And I even would sometimes lie to my children when we're going to the doctor and I knew that an evil man was going to plunge a sharp object into their pudgy thigh, I would still say, it's going to be great, let's go to the doctor. And, and I would lie to my children. Uh, they, they've spent a few hours in counseling over, over my, uh, you know, dishonesty. Uh, but I always felt like a fraud when I would do that to my kids because I knew I was lying to them. I knew I was saying, hey, it's going to be great. And yet I knew from their perspective, it's going to be really hard. And yet I would do that because I felt like the net result on the back end of the event was worth it. It was, it was healthy for them, even though on the front end it was going to seem hard. I was willing to go through hard to get to what I thought was healthy. And that sort of resonates with me today. Um, I think you'll understand that more as, as we get into it. So ancient historical scholar Larry Hurtado has identified five key characteristics of early Christianity. And this has been fascinating to me. Uh, Hurtado said that early Christians were non-retaliatory. They wouldn't they wouldn't fight back against people when they said awful things about them. They wouldn't even fight back when people did awful things to them. I mean, they threw them to lions and lit, lit them with pitch and all this terrible stuff, and they wouldn't fight back. They were non-retaliatory. Her title says they also advocated for the poor. You know, advocating for the rich and the powerful, the connected, that's always been popular. Everybody's always wanted to do that. Because if you, if you advocate for them, they may do something back in return. But advocating for the poor... Advocating for those who couldn't return the favor, that was new. That was revolutionary. That was Christian. They also had a strict sexual ethic. And that was completely unheard of in the Roman world. Like uh, most Romans expected their wives, their girlfriends to be chaste and committed and all of those pure, all of those things. Uh, that was not new. But, but Christians also expected the men to be chaste and committed and pure, and that was completely new. That was revolutionary. That was, that was now Christian. Now, you may notice that this has been the recent focus of Wellspring's teachings. So the Tension series was all about the idea of non-retaliation, and the King Jesus so, series so far has focused on advocating for the poor and a strict sexual ethic. But before I reveal number four and five, which are the next two weeks of the series, today and next week, I want you to notice something important, especially as we're in this heated political season, this environment we find ourselves in. Two of the items on the list are stereotypically considered Republican issues. Two of the items on the list are stereotypically seen as Democrat issues. And honestly, one of the items on the list, no one does. Like, no one embraces non-retaliation. We're all hateful to one another. No one does that. That's why I actually got three weeks instead of just one. Um, so making Jesus your king will likely ruffle all of us because that's not how we live our life. The way he would call us to is not always how. And maybe in some areas we'll line up and say, oh, that's me. In other areas, like, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right at all. And in fact, if, if following Jesus never ruffles you a little bit, you may have misunderstood. I may have misunderstood. Making Jesus our king will likely ruffle all of us today because far too many Christians read their Bible a few minutes a month and allow CNN and Fox News to disciple you six hours a day. And that's got to change. 
For the sake of our country, that's got to change. For the sake of the church, that's got to change. That's not where we need to go. So next week, week five uh, in this list, week four in the series, we're going to talk about how early Christians, at a time when everyone cared for their own, everyone cared for their people, their family, their tribe, their race, their country of origin, Christians also welcomed the stranger. And today we're going to consider how Christians were protectors of life. I, I uh, Looking at this list, I asked Chris's watch earlier, and his watch said I would need six months to recover from this list. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll try to start that the week after next. Now I would ask you, uh, seriously, uh, over the next two weeks, because some of you probably who get ruffled this week will be very excited next week, and some of you will be very ruffled next week will be excited this week. So I would ask you over the next two weeks for you to keep an open mind, an open heart, give what I'm saying a chance. I would also ask that you stay all the way to the end and, and get the full picture before you object. I think that will be helpful to you as well. Okay, this document here is known as the Ebers Papyrus. It's a 20 meter long scroll from ancient Egypt. Uh, it's now currently housed in the, Le the Leipzig Library in Germany, Leipzig, Germany. It was written just a few years before Moses was born in 1550 BC in, in Egypt. It was a medical document and outlined uh, the current treatments of the day, the best knowledge, the best technology of the day. It, it told them ways to use herbs. It told them ways to use procedures to heal all kinds of ailments and maladies that might have happened in, in ancient Egypt. A couple examples. So they said if you had a burn, like on your arm or your leg or whatever, it says you get a, a, a frog and you place the frog inside a, uh, down into a pot with a mixture of oils in the pot. So it gave specific oils. And you put the frog down in the oil, and then you began to heat the pot up. And once the oil and the frog got warm, you would take the frog, dripping with oil, think like a loofah, and you would rub it on the burn, and that would, that would heal your burn, according to the Ebers Papyrus. The Ebers Papyrus also recommended, if you were constipated, that you eat berries and you drink beer. And some of you are going to try that later today. Like, that's going to happen for somebody... In Spring Hill, uh, beer and berries, that'll, that'll be a new uh, treatment. The Ebers Papyrus also is the first recorded document in history, first known one at least, that describes methods of abortion. It, it describes how to, quote, empty out the conceived. And I bring that to your attention because this is a really old debate. Uh, abortion in, in those days was, was dangerous. They didn't have the technology that we do now. And honestly, it was unreliable in the ancient world. Some of the treatments, as you might imagine, didn't actually, quote, empty out the conceived. Um, so a more common practice in the ancient world, and this goes all the way up to, to Jesus' time, was a practice called exposure. And we'll talk about that more in just a minute. But it's in the same category. So last week, I, I started the message by holding up this uh, chalkboard, this blank slate. And I use it as an analogy to say, if you came at a topic with no ideas, no experiences, no thoughts, no past, you would be the blank slate. But how a, a group of people, when they come to a topic, typically are not completely blank. That was true last week when we talked about sexual stuff, certainly true this week as we're talking about uh, this topic. And so I just want to ask that you keep an open mind, whatever your background is, whatever thoughts or experiences you might have had, keep an open mind, keep an open heart. And again, I'd ask you, if you feel like I say something correctly and you're agreeing with it, I'd ask you not to be overly exuberant about that because you may be approaching this topic from a, a political standpoint or an ideological standpoint, and yet somebody else, maybe somebody sitting near to you, may be approaching this discussion of abortion from a very personal place or even a very painful place. And so I'd ask that you just you, you kind of be mindful of that, be empathetic about that. I'm confident in this room that we have Christians and non-Christians. And I'm so glad you're all here. If you're exploring faith, or if you're watching online exploring faith, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're entering this conversation with us. I'm also confident in this room we have pro-life voters and pro-choice voters. I'm confident in this room we have women whose babies have been aborted and men whose babies have been aborted. I'm confident in this room we have men and women who have regrets from their past concerning abortion and maybe men and women who, don't, who may not have regrets. I'm confident in this room, we have people who think, I can't believe the church is finally is talking about this, to others who are saying, finally, the church is talking about this. And I'm also absolutely convinced 
that Jesus offers forgiveness no matter what, that Wellspring offers love no matter what, and that the Bible offers truth no matter what. And I'm hoping this serves as the ground rules for all of us uh, on this topic. Just to also let you know where my heart's at on this. Uh, I love a whiteboard. My staff all makes fun of me for the whiteboard. I love to get a whiteboard. I'm just a visual thinker. And so normally the beginning of a sermon preparation process, I'll start writing out ideas on the whiteboard, and they're all a mess, and it's all crazy. It's just kind of a mind map of all the stuff in my head. And one of the very first things I wrote about two weeks ago when I started preparing diligently for this message, I wrote the word dispassionate. Not because I'm not passionate about this topic. I am. Not because this topic doesn't deserve passion. It does but because I think we're best served and God is most honored if we approach such an important, sensitive, personal conversation with empathy and compassion and clarity and courage. And to do that, it's best to take the unnecessary political heat out of the conversation. And so I'm going to try to approach this from more of a dispassionate place. As part of that, let me, know, let me let you know where we're going. I'm going to look at this topic, we're going to look at this topic today through multiple lenses, historical, philosophical, scientific, biblical, and lastly, practical. We should be out of here by, by about 1.30, so uh, that's good. We're locking the doors uh, momentarily. All right, historians have covered, uncovered a letter written by a deployed Roman officer named Hilarion to his wife back at home in Rome, Alice, is right around the time of Jesus. So this, is, this gives us a picture of, moder- of current thought during Jesus' time and a lot of Bible times. Uh, uh, Hilarion and Alice appear to have one child, and Alice was pregnant with their second. And Hilarion, this tough Roman soldier, centurion, leader uh, of his troops, out fighting the battles against, against those enemies of Rome, uh, shows his tender side in this letter. He was doting on Alice. He, he said, how can I forget you? I beg you not to be anxious. He's, he's worried about her, even as he's out on the battlefield. But Hilarion also included some, some pictures, windows, if you will, into current thought about how people approached things like we're describing today. He writes, I'll t- take care of the little one. And, and he describes how he's going to send money back home from the battlefield to help, help care for the little one. And then in regards to her pregnancy, he says, if it's a boy, let it be. If it's a girl, cast it out. And I'm going to leave that quote up there for just a minute. Exposure in the ancient world was a very common practice. Uh, It was believed then that an infant was not fully human until it was eight days old. In fact, at eight days, there would be a ceremony of sorts. They would, uh, the father would declare that this is now part of our family. He or she is part of our family. And they would be formally welcomed into the family. But until the eighth day, it was completely legal, completely accepted, like socially, for you to abandon your child into the garbage. It wasn't, it wasn't a life. Sometimes those babies would die from exposure. Sometimes those babies would be uh, taken by slave traders who would raise them up to become slaves. And because there was an overwhelmingly large percentage of little girls being exposed, like Hilarion I think demonstrates, slave traders horrifically knew uh, specific ways to capitalize on abandoned daughters. And as a father of daughters, it's horrifying to me. All this began to change with the ministry of Jesus. Hurtado says early Christians, when it came to child exposure, were known for basically saying, instead of throwing your child on the trash heap or drowning it, we will take your child in. Christians were known as people to whom you could take an unwanted child and they would bring it up. Jesus and his followers after him began to change the way the entire world viewed ethics in response to children. You can even see this in the, in the Bible, in the Gospels, if you're reading it with that mindset. Three of the four Gospels record an important scene in Jesus' life that we find out of Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 says people were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them When Jesus saw this, he was indignant, and he said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Now, when you read that, don't just think children or adolescents. If you look at the Greek text, which I have, that that makes that clear. This is not just referring to regular old children. There's a word for child. This isn't that word. 
This is a similar word, a related word, that refers to younger children, littler children. Uh, And notice that Mark says that they were brought, they were brought. Sounds like some of them weren't walking. Maybe lots of them weren't walking. You should think toddler, think baby when you read this passage. So moms and dads were bringing their toddlers to Jesus, babies to Jesus, and the disciples who had grown up in Hilarion's day, they had had the culture seep into them, as we all can sometimes do, and they said, these guys don't matter. They're just babies. They're just toddlers. They don't matter. Get them away from Jesus. Cast them out. Discard them. They don't matter. They were indignant that the parents were interrupting Jesus with with these children who don't matter. And Jesus, when he saw it, he was indignant at them. Many translations use the word angry. Some some tra- the New King James says, greatly displeased. The disciples were indignant at the parents. Jesus was indignant at them. And because of Jesus, infants facing exposure now had a third possibility. Death, slave traders, or Christians who would raise these precious abandoned children not to exploit them, not to sell them, but to adopt them, not to keep them down, but to lift them up as children of God made in the image of God with the dignity of God. People in the ancient world stopped leaving babies in garbage dumps and started leaving babies at churches and monasteries. In fact, the, the modern idea of orphanages often started with Christians who were in communities finding themselves raising many children, and so they would build onto the church or onto the monastery a a place for these children to live, for them to raise. And years later, Christian Emperor Constantine banned infanticide for the first time in history, and a few years after that, Christian Emperor Valentinian bans infant exposure for the first time in history against public pressure because of their shared allegiance to Jesus. That's, history, that's the history of Christianity's intersection with abortion. Let's talk philosophy just a minute. There's a debate in our culture about when someone becomes human. Is it at the moment of birth? Is it the moment of viability? Is it at the moment of conception? Or is there maybe another marker that we should look at and say that's the point when, when someone becomes a being, someone becomes a human? The ancient world chose another marker. They, they chose eight days after a child's birth. I don't know why they chose eight days. I, I, I looked and couldn't find it. If you find it, I'd love to know just out of curiosity. It seems fairly arbitrary to me. Like a seven-day-old infant, not a person, eight-day-old infant, that's a person. It just seems arbitrary. And, and modern philosophers are also debating these markers and trying to decide which marker philosophically makes the most sense. Dr. Peter Singer recently retired from Princeton University. He was a professor, and for 25 years, he served as the chair of the bioethics department. 25 years as the leader of the bioethics department at one of America's premier universities, one of the world's premier universities. Singer is a voice of authority today. He's adamantly pro-choice because he says fetuses lack the essential characteristics of personhood. And then he describes what those, those characteristics are. He says a, a, a person has rationality, autonomy, and self-consciousness. And according to Singer, if you don't have rationality, autonomy, and self-consciousness, you're not fully human. And if you're not fully human, you don't have guaranteed human rights either. So Singer is pro-choice, obviously, but he disagrees philosophically with many advocates today of abortion. Singer says that fetuses don't have these characteristics, but newborn infants don't have those characteristics either. Look at this quote from Singer. He says, The liberal search for a morally crucial dividing line between the newborn baby and the fetus has failed to yield any event or stage of development that can bear the weight of separating those with the right to life from those who lack such a right. Let me say this in everyday terms. Singer believes that a parent has a right to terminate a pregnancy at any point in the pregnancy, But he also recommends, from a philosophical basis, he's a philosopher, that we give parents a full 28 days after birth to see if the children will add to society, to see if they'll add to their parents' happiness. And if they do, at the end of those 28 days, then they become uh, the fully human and they fully get the right to life. 
As one of the preeminent voices in American bioethics today, Dr. Singer does not believe that passage through a birth canal somehow magically changes anything ontologically about the child. They still lack, according to Singer, rationality, autonomy, and self-consciousness. Now, I think his views are abhorrent. But I also think he's intellectually honest. An embryo or fetus is not viable on their own, neither is a toddler. An embryo or a fetus is a significant financial burden on his or her parents, so is a toddler. An embryo or fetus inflicts significant psychological challenge, so does a toddler, so does a teenager, for that matter. I mean, none of that changes with a little bit of age. I agree with Singer that there's not a morally crucial dividing line between the newborn baby and the fetus, but I believe that the personhood and life begin much, much earlier, and we'll, we'll say more about that in just a second. Let's talk science for just a minute. Eight weeks after conception, by eight weeks, sometimes before on some of these things, by eight weeks, a baby can bend his or her elbow. A baby has fingers and toes, eyelids and ears. They have a, a thumb that they can suck and that they do suck at eight weeks after conception. At eight weeks, if, if a baby is, uh, during a procedure or something, is poked with a needle, because their nervous system is already up and running at eight weeks after conception, a baby will recoil from pain and try to get away from the needle. At eight weeks, they are, scientifically speaking, distinct from the mother. Because at eight weeks, they have their own fingerprints. At eight weeks, they have their own DNA genetic code. In fact, that happens much earlier at conception. They have their own blood type by eight weeks. And by, in about 50% of the cases, obviously, at eight weeks, they have their own gender because some of those are, are boys in there. At eight weeks, scientifically, they are distinct from their mother, if not before, at least by eight weeks. By eight weeks, all major organs are functioning, brain, nervous system, kidney, and lungs. Not even all middle schoolers have a fully functioning brain, and yet at eight weeks, at eight weeks after conception, your baby does. By the second trimester, this is a few weeks later, 12 weeks into the pregnancy, 12 weeks after conception. Uh, by the way, at, at 12 weeks, second trimester, at, about 10% of abortions still happen after that. I, I want to be fair. I think some pro-life groups overstate, some politicians overstate the idea of late-term abortions. About 90% are first trimester, less than 10 are after that. But by the second trimester, 12 weeks after conception, bones have begun to calcify. And this is such a big takeaway for me. The baby is too big second trimester and beyond, to be extracted vaginally without the dilation of birth. So the calcified bones, especially the skull, have, have to be broken prior to removal. And they're, they're calcified, they're bones. One broken bone for you or me or for a child is painful. Multiple broken bones, like an accident or a crash, excruciating. A late-term baby's bones must be crushed. And they feel pain. By 21 weeks, a baby can live outside the womb with just a little bit of medical support. Now, by the way, I said a minute ago, pro-life groups sometimes overstate uh, the frequency of, of late-term abortions, and they do. Sometimes pro-choice groups overstate the case of teen moms, rape, incest, life of the mother as a cause. Over 90% of women who have abortions are in their 20s or 30s or beyond. Less than 10% are teenage mothers. And one study, numbers are sketchy because... Um, States, I didn't know this, maybe you didn't know this, states aren't required to report anything. So some states don't report anything to the federal government uh, on abortions. Uh, but one found, study found that 88% of second, term, second trimester abortions were elective and less than 1% were because of the combination of rape, incest, life, and the mother. Less than 1% combined were those three causes. While people should have autonomy over their own body, scientifically, the baby inside the mother is not a part of her body. Scientifically, the baby is a second person, and the second person has rights. Let's talk biblically a second. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 1 says, The word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before I, you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. God knew Jeremiah. God had plans for Jeremiah as an individual, as a person, before he was born, before his birth. David writes in Psalm 139, You created my inmost being. 
you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Luke, Luke chapter 1 records Mary going to see her cousin Elizabeth. It's a story that's cute and it's fun, unless you're thinking of it through the lens that we're describing today, and then it's horrific, honestly, because Mary found herself in a difficult pregnancy, and her cousin Elizabeth, who she visited, also found herself in an unusual pregnancy. And when Mary walks in Elizabeth's door, look what happened in Luke chapter 1. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you'll bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Prenatal John the Baptist was excited that prenatal Jesus was in the room. I think the most important biblical narrative on this topic, in my opinion, happens early in Scripture. In fact, I, I showed you the Ebers papyrus from Egypt a moment ago. This happens just a few years after that, also in Egypt. The Pharaoh of Egypt, in a horrific display of power, I mean terrible display of power, declared that all newborn Hebrew boys must be thrown into the Nile. Now, Moses' mother, if you've not read this, you can read this later. Moses' mother deftly navigates the circumstances. She ultimately guides her baby with her daughter to Moses, to Pharaoh's daughter, and then into his household. You should read that later, Exodus 1 or 2. I skipped over a whole bunch to get to the bottom line. The story is relevant for this topic today because Pharaoh had made a political decision. Baby boys become armies. Armies make my life unsafe. Get rid of the babies. Done. He made the order. He signed his name. He made the stamp. Whatever it was, it's done. But then he met the baby. And at that point, it ceased to be a political issue. Now it became Moses. Now it became his grandson. It became a real child, not a political issue. And abortion has become strictly a political issue. Right, left, Trump, Harris. And so we debate viability and ontology and philosophy as if somehow they're just political topics. But what we need to do, what we need to be reminded of is at the center of this debate is a baby, a helpless, vulnerable child who needs our protection. Proverbs 31 says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, ensure justice for those being crushed. Yes, speak up for the poor and the helpless and see they get justice. And the church has been too silent on this issue. I think I've been too silent, just in confession. I've been too silent on this issue. You know, preparing for this message was difficult. I would imagine hearing it is probably equally difficult. And it's prompted me to ask myself, kind of introspectively, if I've handled this correctly over the years. I've avoided it. I think this may be the second time in 20 plus years I've talked about abortion at the church. I don't want to be political. I don't want Wellspring to be political. You, you, you go to some churches and it's like you're going to a rally or something. It's ridiculous. I don't think that's the way forward for the church. But I, I chose to address it now because we're in a series that are, it's not going to be specifically right or left. We're going to ruffle people on both sides of the aisle. But I really wonder if we won't look back historically, years from now, the church, not just us, but the church, and realize that we were duped into a grievous evil because guys like me didn't want to be political. I think that may be the case. And I feel bad about that. Okay, we've looked historically, philosophically, scientifically, and biblically. Let's talk, let's talk practically for a second. Abortion ends the life of roughly one million babies each year. Numbers are down from the, the late 80s, early 90s, but actually up over the last few years. Numbers are on the rise. According to the CDC, this is, by the way, this is, of all the things I studied and read, many of which I didn't include, this, what I'm going to tell you is the most horrific thing I saw. According to the CDC, there are 204 abortions for every 1,000 live births. 204 abortions for every 1,000 live births. That's a, about a one to five ratio, one abortion for every five births. For perspective, this week, today and Wednesday night, Wellspring will have about 300 kids and students come through this building. That happens every week, Monday to Thursday. More than that, when you count in preschool, Monday to Thursday at Taws. 
And that means we have lots of women, we have lots of men who have faced the agonizing decision of abortion. And I'm confident that Jesus offers forgiveness no matter what. Wellspring offers love no matter what. The Bible offers truth no matter what. And let me, and let me just say, I was talking to somebody in between services who is a nurse, has had lots of very personal exposure to this topic. And she said, I, I, I wish the moms and the dads who've made this decision would realize that A, God forgives them, and B, you'll see those babies again. And that's true. Jesus offers forgiveness no matter what. Wellspring offers love no matter what. The Bible offers truth no matter what. But if the one to five ratio is correct in Spring Hill, one abortion for every five live births, and if it should be assumed, which it should, that most people do not make this decision flippantly, it's agonizing and painful and worthy of much compassion. And that likely means that many of the, the men and women who made the decisions they made, made it because they couldn't do it on their own. They, they, they couldn't raise the children, or they couldn't raise them without lots of extra support. And that's why they made the difficult choice. And if that's all true, and I believe that it is, that means we cannot be political as if it's somebody else's problem. We can't be judgmental as if this has not personally affected friends of ours or neighbors of ours or our church family. It has. Consider this. If, if the one to five ratio is accurate in Spring Hill, we have nine elementary schools in Spring Hill. So we must be prepared personally, individually, and as a church, to sacrifice financially and with lots and lots and lots of our time and energy and prayers to put our money where our mouth is. A political issue requires you to vote and walk away. We're telling them what, to do, what we want them to do. That's a political issue. This is not just a political issue. This is a personal issue. It requires us to be personally involved in the solution. And if Spring Hill has had in the last few years enough abortions to fill two elementary schools, Wellspring must do more. I don't see the American church coming together on politics. I don't. And, and you know what? That's probably okay. I'm not sure that when the church and the politics get in bed together, it's good for the church. It doesn't have to. But we must come together to support moms in grueling situations. And we must come together to support babies in tough situations. James chapter 1, I read this from the, I picked this from the, the reader's version, which is a children's Bible version. Here are the beliefs and way of life that God our Father accepts as pure and without fault. When widows are in trouble, take care of them and do the same for children who have no parents. Pure religion requires us to provide support for moms who are alone and for babies who are alone. And there's a lot of them. And the church has to do more. It's going to require time and money and leadership and lots of sacrifice. The political landscape in Tennessee has changed in the last few years on this topic. That's part one. Part two is the personal side of ministry. And I don't trust any of the politicians to lead out on part two. Part two is what do we do now with those moms? What do we do now with those babies? What do we do now with those dads? It's time for the church to do what the church can do. Politics has done what politics can do. Now it's time for the church to lead the way. The church must lead the way. The church must do more. Let me step out of this topic for just a minute. I think there's a lot of confusion over this topic. I think in similar ways, maybe even more prevalent ways, there's a lot of confusion over what the church is about. And, and we, have, we have allowed culturally the church to be defined by a bunch of good people who come together and do religious things and look down judgmentally at the rest of the world as if somehow we're better and they're worse. That has nothing to do with the Bible. That has nothing to do with the ministry and life of Jesus. When you watch Jesus' life, the arguments he had, the biggest arguments he had, weren't with non-Christian people doing non-Christian things. His biggest arguments were with pastor types like me who, who weren't being compassionate to those who were in broken spots. That was his biggest fights. His, his 
rallies, if you want to use the term, invited lots of people who aren't typically welcome at church socials. But they're welcome at Jesus. A better analogy from the country club for the righteous, a better analogy is a a hospital for the spiritually broken. And we're all residents there, starting right here with me. And so if you come to this topic, or any, honestly, and you have regret from your past, and you have pain from your past, and you look back and think, man, I didn't handle this right or that right, this topic or any other, I want you to know that Jesus loves you no matter what, that he offers forgiveness because he shed his blood to buy that forgiveness, and we love you no matter what, and we will come along with you as we both try to look at the Bible together and align our life more closely to the ways of Jesus. So no matter what your past looks like, if that's where your present is, man, the future is together. Let's do this together. But if the numbers I said are true, and I believe they are, in fact, I think they're probably underreported. If that's true, this season for the church, as it says in Scripture, for such a time as this, this season is going to have to be a season where the church, not just Wellspring, but certainly Wellspring, comes together and sacrifices individually and as families. Some of you are going to be asked to sacrifice. God is going to call on you to, to give of yourself, your your time, your energy, your leadership, your money to help address this problem. I don't know what the answer is, but we got to figure out what the answer is. The politics need to do what the politics need to do, and now the church needs to do what the church needs to do. And it's going to require a significant amount of sacrifice, both individually and as a church. The leaders of our church are going to begin to make some decisions over the next few years about what things do we do without so that we can invest more heavily in what God is requiring us to do here. Time, money, leadership, staff, etc., And we're going to have to look at that. So I want you to know that's coming. I don't know what it looks like yet. Pray with me that we figure out what it looks like, but it's coming. If you're interested in helping craft that solution, let me know, because that's coming. But then secondly, and I say this genuinely as an old guy who has four daughters. I knew that this message would be painful for some. Not from a, you're saying something I don't agree with politically, I'm mad about that, offended, that, okay, I'm fine with that, beat me up for that, that's fine. More from a, there are things in my past that I can't undo, and you're putting salt in the wound to feel. And as a father of four daughters, it breaks my heart that that might be how that gets received. And I just want you to know that in Christ there is freedom, in Christ there is forgiveness, In Christ, there is hope for eternity where you'll be welcomed into the arms of the Lord by lots of people who love you, including your children. In just a moment, we're going to have a a time where we're going to sing, and I'm going to walk over here, and I want to invite you at any point or the next, I don't know, 30 minutes or so, I'm just going to stay over here. I won't be in the lobby. Um, so if you want to come during the song and, and let's talk, I'd love to listen. We'll pray. It'd be great. If you want to wait till after the room clears out, I'm just going to hang out here for a while. In fact, Amy's going to come in. We're going to be over here together. And um, I just want you to know we love you. No matter what. And, and Jesus loves you. And he died to forgive you. And if you've asked for forgiveness, he's already done that. And maybe it's time to forgive yourself. And release the shame that the enemy's holding you down with. And, uh, and then it's time for us to come together and figure out what we, what we do for such a time as this, because this is where we are. Let me, let me pray, and then I'll, we'll wrap up. Dear Lord, I pray that the, the, the stillness of this room indicates what I've been praying for, that, that your Spirit's doing what your Spirit can only do. And God, I pray that in such a varied topic that you will provide what each of us needs. That you'll provide what each of us needs. And that may be different person to person. Lord, we come to you as broken people in need of a Savior. This is just another example of how that's true. And so God, I pray that to this room you bring peace 
for some who haven't had it in a long time, that you'd bring forgiveness where that's appropriate, that you'd bring hope and love where that's needed, that you'd bring vision, challenge where that's needed. God, whatever we need, we, we come to you as the solution because you are our king. And we want to build our life according to your ways, according to your truth, according to your grace, according to your son. And we commit to do that as our king and in his name. Amen.